Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this second webinar on Rockport climate impacts. And tonight we're going to be looking at downtown, um, specifically Dock Square and Bearskin Neck. Uh, we have a great uh, program for you tonight with some wonderful speakers. Um, I'm Maureen Aylward, I'm the director of Town Green. And just a note about Town Green, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We focus on climate impact, community education programs, public outreach, and climate-related research just for Cape Ann. Um, we are pleased to have you here for this webinar. Um, and I'm going to introduce our speakers right now, and then we'll get into the program. So our first speaker is Doug Rich. Uh, he is here tonight from Susie's Stories. It's an independent bookstore on Bearskin Neck. Doug and his wife Susie founded and opened the store in 2019. The bookstore offers uniquely curated choices from many books on the market for readers young and old. And tonight, Doug will share his climate-related concerns as a business owner and bearskin neck. Uh, Dr. Jane Knott will uh, speak next, and she's the founder and CEO of Hydro Predictions. It's an environmental consulting firm specializing in groundwater hydrology, groundwater remediation, and climate change adaptation. Uh, Jane has authored several scientific journal articles on climate change adaptation for coastal road infrastructure and on the impacts of climate change on water resources. She holds a PhD in civil environmental engineering from the University of New Hampshire and a master's degree in civil and environmental engineering from MIT. And we're very lucky to have Jane not on the board of directors at Town Green. Um, Jim Gardner is uh, going to speak tonight. He's currently the chairman of the Rockport DPW Board of Commissioners, and he has been a DPW commissioner for 12 years. Prior to serving as a DPW commissioner, he served 10 years on the Rockport Finance Committee and was chair of that committee for two years. He'll share some perspectives um, on DPW concerns in downtown Rockport. And finally, we'll hear from um, Harvard Graduate School of Design's Kira Klinging, who will talk about how a Category 3 hurricane will impact downtown Rockport. Kira is a lecturer in landscape architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and a research associate at the Office for Urbanization. We will close out this evening's webinar with a Q&A session uh, to allow for the sharing of thoughts, ideas, and concerns. And the presentation is being recorded this evening and will be available on the Town Green website uh, later this week, um, at the most Monday, uh, uh, on, on the website towngreen2025.org. So let's get started. Um, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Doug Rich from Susie's Stories and to welcome him to tell his story. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for uh, having us here. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I would say that um, while we're very grateful to be here today, uh, when I mentioned to Tom Meekus that I was interested in uh, learning more about what Town Green is doing, and I knew my wife in particular would have a, a, a deep interest in this. This has been a passion of hers for a while in terms of climate change in general, and now it affects us in particular on Bearskin Neck. Um, I didn't realize it would lead to an opportunity for me to speak at uh, the first time I actually was part of a Town Green meeting. But I'm happy to do so. Uh, with the caveat that, as I point out, I'm um, we are definite newbies down here on Bearskin Neck. So we've only been here since 2019. So we, you know, we don't have the deep perspective of maybe some other store owners that have been there for a long time. But we do have uh, we do have our concerns and and in, in what's going on in Bearskin Neck and feel largely invested in it. So um, we did open in 2019, and it was kind of the gradual result of an increase in attraction over, over a few years in, in Bearskin Neck. And then we realized that there was an opportunity for us to open a business here. And uh, the attraction was largely due, of course, to the proximity to the ocean. And in a way, reminiscent of, very different from, but somewhat reminiscent of the boardwalks I grew up with as a kid on the East Coast. And I love the, especially in the summer, um, that kind of a feeling. Um, and this kind of offers a lot of that. So we now find ourselves here with the store. Um, we are, we are aware of the, of the weather situation here, uh, generally, and we know about some of the legendary storms here, um, 
the 2018 nor'easter, for instance, I think that was Ridley, uh, Riley, um, that storm. Um, that's the most recent one that we actually have been somewhat involved in up here. Um, the more recent weather events we've seen, I guess would be related to what's happened on Bradley Wharf, the flooding on Bradley Wharf, and maybe not directly related uh, as a weather event, but the, uh, the dock square uh, pump station situation. So there's a lot of susceptibility here that we're now starting to feel um, could possibly encroach upon us. So in terms of our experience of what's impacted us directly, um, high winds have caused us a couple of issues back in 2021. There was um, one of the heavy rainstorms um, actually forced water into the store through the roof. And so we've, we had to sustain some repairs and we did, we did experience minor losses, but nothing, nothing very major. But um, also as a, as a result of that storm, our sign and the building uh, in the front of the store experienced some damage from, from high winds blowing the sign around. Uh, we didn't, fortunately, we didn't lose our sign entirely. We did see some signs knocked entirely off their masts by, by that particular storm. Um, so we try to come up with different ways to deal with that, with that situation and different ways to suspend the, the signage to avoid uh, damage in the future. We haven't experienced any flooding uh, per se, but if our bookstore got flooded, um, there's a couple of things that would be an issue for us. We're, we're slightly elevated from Bradley Wharf, but we can clearly see um, the rising tides there and how it could actually you know, get to that level of where we are uh, fairly easily in high tides. Um, I'd say less than a foot of water coming up off the back of the seawall there um, behind Bradley Wharf would actually cause us, if if we got a foot of water in the store of six inches, we, we've we sustained some losses to inventory uh, through storage and through some of our, the books we even have displayed, which are displayed all up and down the wall, um, down to almost to the floor itself. And uh, we have, we're in one of the old fishing shacks uh, very durable in some ways, but we think that we do we do believe that if there was water to to enter um, the floor of that store, that we'd now be looking at that, that thing being totally redone. Probably that'd have to be a tear down and a rebuild. And uh, the only other thing I can say that that is uh, of direct interest to us in terms of what the what the changing weather situation is going to bring in the near future is we are interested in the, in the next few years in expansion possibly. And while we're we're renters now, we do have an interest in actually, you know, possibly uh, with the right situation, owning our our land as well and our property. And so, you know, we look at the at the the property values now, um, and we wonder, you know, how will they be impacted in the future due to changing weather and climate impacts on Bearskin Neck and in Rockport in general. So that's kind of the state of, of where we are with, with weather and climate in, uh, in Rockport as regards to Susie stories. Thanks so much, uh, Doug, for sharing that. And folks, if you have questions uh, for Doug, you can put them in the chat or you can wait until the Q&A session. Um, thanks so much for sharing your, your concerns and, and your story. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Jane Nutt. Jane? Hi, everybody. Um, I guess we have about 48 participants. Um, so that's great. Is that correct, Maureen? About, about 50 people, I believe. Yep. Um, so it's really great to have everyone here and it's wonderful to hear Doug's story. Thank you very much for sharing your story, Doug. Um, it, uh, hearing from the local residents always uh, is, is important because it's really the local folks that are gonna to have to deal with these issues and come up with ideas. Um, so let's just move ahead with the slides. Um, Many of you have already seen some of my slides on uh, Good Harbor Beach and then on, on Long Beach. Um, essentially, I've done basically the same thing in looking at incremental sea level rise in downtown Rockport. So I'll share that with you tonight. Um, we'll start with this curve, which you're probably familiar with. This is the projected global sea level rise scenarios. Um, and I won't go into a lot of detail with this, but the uh, let's let me just use the highlighter for a minute. 
Um, the black line here is the sea level rise that we've already experienced up till the year 2000. And then the colored lines here are showing the projected levels of sea level rise. And as you can see, there's, um, there's quite a spread in the, in the various scenarios. Um, and these, the, the uncertainty that you see um, after 2020 essentially is the human element, which is how quickly can we move away from fossil fuels and the uncertainty of what's going on in Antarctica. So the next few slides that I'll be showing you uh, on downtown Rockport with incremental sea level rise, um, I, I'd like to just explain what it is. It's a, um, I use the simple elevation model, sometimes called a bathtub model, where you just look at the ground surface elevations and the static water levels. Um, this type of analysis underestimates the actual water level uh, that'll be experienced for the sea levels given because it doesn't include wave action it doesn't include storm surge. It doesn't include wind-driven um, storm surge. And it doesn't include atmospheric pressure changes. So I want you to understand that this is just these scenarios um, are, are just kind of an, an idea for you to see how things are changing, where the water will come in um, in certain places as uh, the level sea level rise um, goes up. Uh, the, the, is, so this would be like sea level that's under a very calm condition. So it's just, it's, it's, there's no waves, there's no wind, there's nothing. It's just the elevation of the sea. So this is uh, mean higher high water, which is basically the average of the highest daily high tide. So this is really just your high, high tide in, in Rockport. And I wanna point out that this analysis is based on LIDAR land surface elevations. And so there are some, um, there are some things that are wrong. You'll, you'll see that this, this wharf here will disappear pretty quickly. In reality, it won't. It's just because the LIDAR data that I used does, does not have the correct elevation for, the, for this wharf. So if you were to do an analysis and really look into the, um, the details of what what buildings would be impacted. Um, you would need to have surveyed information on the ground, surveyed information to ground, ground truth, the, the LIDAR data that we're using. But again, this is just a basic um, uh, demonstration to give you an idea of what these sea levels will look like. So this is one foot of sea level rise above mean high or high water, or it could be one foot of storm surge today. So same thing, it could be sea level rise or it could be one foot of storm surge. And as you can see, there's not a whole lot that's different. The water's getting deeper, as you can tell by the darker blue color, um, but it's really, it's encroaching a little bit more, but not a lot. And this is because Rockport has very steep uh, banks, essentially walls that, that are keeping the water out. And this, this, this kind of analysis also considers that the walls are waterproof. So as we know, the walls in Rockport are built out of granite block and, and there's gaps between the granite blocks. So there would be some water encroachment through those blocks that are not being shown by this. This is two feet of sea level rise or two feet of storm surge or a combination of the two. Still not a whole lot of difference. Three feet, you're seeing a little more encroachment. You're seeing more of it over this side here a little bit down here along the edges. Um, motif number one um, is still okay. Uh, and some of these, these docks here are, are okay and you still have the breakwater out here. Now four feet of sea level rise, four feet of sea level rise above mean higher high water. We experienced four feet of storm surge during hurricane, during, um, the storm Riley that Doug mentioned, that was March of 2018. Um, and at the, the four feet that I say, let's see, I think it was 4.3 feet above mean higher high water that was measured in Boston at the very highest point of high tide. And so this is starting to show a little bit of inundation of Tuna Wharf, uh, inundation of the, the wharf going out to motif number one. 
these wharfs down here um, and some some encroachment. Well, it's it's really up to the it's really up to the wall in this area. Five feet of sea level rise. This is where you get the walls overtopped. And like I was saying, um, these these are granite walls. So so this simulation is assuming that the water doesn't come in until it overtops the wall. Well, we know that that's really not the case. You're going to have rising groundwater as well, and you're going to have water coming in through the through the gaps um, between the the um, granite blocks. But here you see significant flooding. Um, big difference between four feet and five feet of sea level rise. Keep going, um, six feet of sea level rise. Now, again, I wanna make the point that six feet of sea level rise could be the same as um, two feet of sea level rise with four feet of storm surge. So this is just a water level essentially. So um, two feet of sea level rise would occur by mid century, let's say, and then a, a storm that has four feet of storm surge like like the like Riley in March of 2018 could look like this. And then we jump, let's see, where's six? Six, and then we jump to eight, just to give you an idea, eight feet of sea level rise. I, again, uh, we're really not predicting eight feet of sea level rise in this century. We are predicting it by 2022. Um, Sea level rise doesn't stop at the end of the century, it continues. Um, but uh, this level of water you could you could see by having you know three feet of sea level rise and five feet of storm surge on top of that. So I showed you the uh, the global projections for sea level rise, and I showed you what it might look like in Rockport. Um, so what are really the like, what's the likely range of projected sea level rise um, for the Boston area? And this was done, uh, this, there was a GBRAG report, which is called the Greater Boston Research Area Group uh, report that was finished in 2022. And they wanted to see what was really the likely range for the Boston area. So the likely projections of relative sea level rise from 2030 to 2050 would be approximately a foot to a foot and a half, um, 2050 to 2070 would be 1.7 to 2.8. Um, and you can see over here that the rates of increase are of sea level rise, um, the rates of increase are increasing. So it's, it's, it's accelerating over time. And 2070 to 2100, the likely level of sea level rise would be 2.8 to 4.8 essentially. So we're getting up into that five foot um, level, you know, within this within this century without any storm surge on top of it. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken by Samantha Kathopoulos, um, and it was on the Good Morning Gloucester page. This was flooding on Bearskin Neck, uh, Tuna Wharf, um, during the storm of January 2018. Um, and I believe that the um, that the water level was recorded at five feet at the Boston gauge uh, at high tide during this storm. So this is what five feet, a level of five feet of water um, looks like uh, with waves and wind on bearskin neck. Uh, this slide is basically, I just want to point out that as sea level rises, groundwater also rises. Um, and this is a cross section of a road showing the asphalt layer here, the base layer, gravel base layer here, sub base, let's say of sand, and then the natural soils beneath that. And as groundwater rises with sea level rise, which it will do in these coastal communities, it weakens the roads. Um, and that results in fatigue cracking of the asphalt uh, and rutting. Also, when groundwater rises with uh, sea level rise, you have problems with your underground infrastructure. Sewage can leak uh, out of cracks in pipes and high groundwater can seep into pipes causing problems for sewage treatment systems. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, the Rockport DPW Commissioner, Jane, Jim Gardner, 
uh, and he's going to give us uh, a little bit of insights on infrastructure and flooding concerns. Thanks, Jane. Uh, I don't have anything prepared, uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions along the way, but um, I think the the situation in Rockport is that we have many areas that are threatened by sea level rise. Um, all of our recreational beaches are armored uh, in one way or another, which means that we have prevented them from moving backward in the, you know, in order to accommodate sea level rise. Uh, it means that they will eventually, if we, if they continue to be armored, they will continue to erode and we will eventually lose them. Um, but certainly our working harbors in our Rockport is the third biggest uh, lobstering uh, port in Massachusetts. Uh, and you know, our working harbors are threatened from sea level rise, our boat landings are threatened, our moorings are threatened, docks. Uh, certainly Bearskin Neck, as you've seen, uh, is threatened by sea level rise. Um, our pump stations for our sewer system, um, we recently had a situation at our Dock Square pump station, which is our primary pump station. It wasn't due to sea level rise, um, but uh, it was a fairly catastrophic event, and it is vulnerable to uh, to um, sea level rise. Uh, and then all of our you know many low lying roads are vulnerable, and our flat ledge quarry, which is one of our main water sources, is also uh, pretty close to um, to uh, the sea. Uh, it's probably about 250 feet away from uh, Pigeon Cove and um, or rather Granite Pier and um, and extends well below sea level. So it is susceptible to seepage uh, in the event that uh, sea levels come up. So there's a lot for us to worry about with regard to sea level rise in Rockport. Um, unfortunately, I, I have to say that there is at the moment, very little we are doing about it, um, frankly, because we are just struggling to keep what infrastructure we have going, uh, you know, as is. Um, the situation that happened at Dock Square, the pump station there, uh, was due to the fact that we have a, a really aging sewer system, and the the pump stations were built in the 70s, so they're all about 50 years old. And the sewer system itself uh, is fairly leaky. And so when we get normal rainfall, um, we will see uh, sewer levels of about 650,000 to 750,000 gallons a day. Um, we have a regulatory limit of 800,000 gallons a day of discharge into the harbor. Um, so we are, during normal situations, we are roughly at about 90% of our regulatory limit uh, in terms of sewer capacity. Um, now, the actual amount of sewage that Rockport generates, though, is only about 450,000 gallons a day, which means that a significant percentage of uh, what we're seeing at the sewer plant is from stormwater leaking into the system. Now, several years ago, we did a lot of work and we tried to patch up the system. We were able to get um, get our flows down because prior to that, we had been under a, a sewer connection moratorium because we were regular, regularly exceeding um, our uh, regulatory limits. Uh, but we were able to get some work done. We got our flows down under the... Um, uh, under uh, 700,000 on a regular basis, and the DEP lifted the moratorium. But since then, and that was you know probably 10 years ago that we did that work. Since then, um, you know our flows have crept back up because it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of money to continue to patch up the sewer system. Um, what happened at Dock Square recently was the result of that of a very leaky sewer system in which you know, when we have significant rainfall and snow melt, uh, it can overwhelm uh, our infrastructure. We did have a problem there where one of the sump pumps failed, but the failure of a sump pump and the extreme amount of flow that we got resulted in 
the flow actually um, submerging the transformer there and blowing the transformer. Uh, so we lost power. We had to bring in a uh, a generator and run the 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 pump station off a generator um, for for quite some time until we were able to get it fixed. Um, but the the thing that strikes me, frankly, having been on the finance committee and and knowing that the town is working under the constraints of Proposition Two and a Half, which means that we we really aren't able to raise revenues as quickly as our costs are raising means that we've consistently over the last few decades that two and a half has been in place we've been sort of chipping away at the the meat you know of on the bones of our of our um, financing structure so that you know we are consistently cutting and what what ends up happening is we end up not doing the maintenance, we end up not replacing equipment, we end up not replacing water mains or fixing manholes simply because, you know, we just don't have the money for it. Um, and the result is that our infrastructure is slowly deteriorating, our roads are deteriorating, our sewer systems are deteriorating, we have a problem with our water um, system as well. Um, and so, you know, I think we know that um, that sea level rise is coming and that it it poses a significant threat to many aspects of uh, the town and especially the town's infrastructure. But we're really sort of uh, hamstrung and caught. We aren't really even able to fix what we have to keep it operating as well as it should, much less uh, start to reconfigure it or or make it uh, resilient to sea level rise. And that's, I think, a problem. Um, I know that we are currently applying for an MVP grant uh, that would address sea level rise issues in Rockport, uh, but we have not had any luck actually in the past getting grants. Um, you know, I think the the grant application process is, um, uh, you know, there's a limited amount of money and we are competing with other towns for grant money. And we're a small town, we don't have a lot of resources and we, I think we, we sometimes we come up short uh, competing with other towns because, you know, we're, we don't have the resources to throw into grant writing or, or finding grants even. Um, so I don't know what will happen with that MVP grant. I know we were also looking for a federal grant, a BRIC grant, it's called, which would help us address, I think it's about $200,000. That would help us address, uh, you know, sea level rise issues or vulnerability issues having to do with our sewer, but we don't know if we will get that money. Um, so again, it's it's a it's a difficult situation because we're we're operating in what, what's called a structural deficit where our, our town costs are going up faster than our revenues can go up. And we're struggling, I think, to keep our infrastructure working at a sufficient level, um, but we have not really started to think about how to upgrade our infrastructure in a way to make it resilient to sea level rise. And I think that's going to be a real challenge in the future. Thanks so much. I can take some questions if anybody has any questions. Um, actually, we'll wait for the end if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, and um, we'll move on. Uh, thanks so much, much for the, all of that information. It was really, really great. And I, I hope that people are writing down their questions for Jim. Um, next, we're going to hear from Kira Klingen, who is from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Those of you who have been on some other webinars know Kira. And she is going to take us through the scenario planning for the great storm and highlight uh, downtown Gloucester. I mean, downtown Rockport. <laughs> Thanks, Maureen. Um, and Jim, thank you. That was really fascinating to hear all of your perspective and expertise. And Jane, as always, as well. Um, so good evening, everyone. And um, we can go to the next slide. 
Um, so for brief context, I know most people have seen this before, uh, but the Office for Urbanization where I work um, with Charles Waldheim is a design research office. And we do scenario planning work through sponsored design research projects. Um, and what I just want to highlight here is just that scenario planning is a methodology to come up with plausible but not probable images of the future. And the idea here is just to be able to give information for decision makers uh, to act in the present. Next. And so over the past uh, year, we've been working on a year-long study that includes two scenarios um, on the Great Storm of 2038 near future adaptation measures, um, and then also looking at net zero housing um, and recovering waste. Next. Uh, but today I'll just be sharing work from scenario zero with a focus on Rockport. Next. And I just wanna highlight that Maureen uh, and Town Green shared out uh, the link to the internally facing website that we created. Um, I'll post the link in the chat at the end as well. But if you're interested in walking through this material at your own pace, um, we're seeing impacts in other places, please feel free to walk through on the website next. And so again, this is a completely fictional storm. Um, it's one that has basis in historical precedent, um, but it's not at all meant to shock um, or make anyone afraid. It's just intended to support you all as you make decisions um, in the present. Next. And the storm explores ways that other places as well as Rockport are changing as well, looking at these 27 different places across Cape Ann. Next. And I really just wanna highlight um, that Across Rockport, I think what Jim was just talking about is really prescient, just that there are so many different areas because the coastline is so crenellated and because you have not only uh, the rocky coast, but then you also have kind of sandy barrier beaches. So there are a lot of different um, uh, kind of shoreline and coastal conditions, and all of those are different to the different types of vulnerable, sorry, to different types of flooding. And so that includes sea level rise, also storm surge. Um, next. And the flood risk in a lot of areas is exacerbated on areas that are filled, and that of course includes bearskin neck. Um, and so these areas are likely to flood again in the future where you've built in areas that used to be ocean or wetland. Next. And this becomes so critical just because hurricanes are becoming increasingly um, intense. So they're becoming much more frequent and not more frequent, but more powerful. Next. And during a hurricane, the storm surge and really the power of those waves is often the most devastating element. Um, and so from this kind of broad level map of Cape Ann, you can really see that Bearskin Neck will be inundated as well as Atlantic Avenue um, on the side. Next. And the storm that we've created, the Great Storm of 2038, is a westward tracking hurricane. Um, and so the nice thing about that, uh, or not nice for Gloucester, but the largest kind of impacts and the largest waves will go south up through Gloucester Harbor, whereas Rockport's Harbor is somewhat sheltered. Um, next. And so in order to actually kind of visualize the storm, we have this fictional scenario in 2038 of a category three hurricane uh, that starts off the coast of Africa and tracks across the Atlantic. Next. Um, and if you can play the animation. And I guess what's really critical here is that as the storm tracks west uh, through, uh, through Western Massachusetts, um, the storm strikes during an astronomical high tide, and so when we think about James' models looking at bearskin neck, um, you can assume that this uh, storm is already striking when all of that water is almost up to, uh, to the wharves or to the piers, and so the storm is really intense just because it arrives when water levels are already high. Next. And if you can play this. And so here we have an animation that walks through uh, the entire storm. Um, and I think things to really kind of pay attention to here, I saw a note in the chat about thinking of Cape Ann as a region. And I think in the case of Rockport, that makes a lot of sense because the Anasquam River uh, separating Gloucester and Rockport means that evacuation routes through the Anasquam during a hurricane or during another uh, large storm event um, could very easily be cut off. Um, as the Anasquam River becomes kind of a harbor uh, with really high water um, and really high waves. And so again, it's important to just think of emergency evacuation routes through Rockport that move through marshlands um, or across the Anasquam River and how all of the communities on Cape Ann are really 
um, kind of interlinked in terms of emergency preparedness and transportation off the island. I think one other thing uh, to kind of think about um, in terms of this larger scale visualization also uh, is just how many the wind in this type of storm, most of the trees and most of our ecosystems are really accustomed to enduring winds during the racer. So coming from the Northeast, but this hurricane with winds from the South would be kind of pushing on vegetation in a completely different way, leading to additional trees. Um, down, being downed and falling over, especially in large areas in Rockport, like Dogtown Common. And of course, when we're thinking about those transportation routes, it's important to think about uh, not having emergency evacuation routes to Addison Gilbert Hospital and other places that folks may need to access. Next. And if you don't mind playing this last animation. So on Bearskin Neck, um, again, as I mentioned, uh, because the harbor isn't self-facing and um, the inner harbor is sheltered uh, by the breakwater, the storm here won't reach the same wave heights as it does in Gloucester. Um, in Rockport, a Category 3 hurricane um, in this scenario would send waves that are still about 18 feet um, up over Bearskin Neck. Um, and again, so another thing to just kind of think about is Mill Pond uh, behind the cemetery, possibly over flooding due to inland rain, which is another um, kind of component of the storm, um, and then coming over Front Street, um, which you can see on the left hand side of the screen. And so again, while well, this is just a zoom in uh, kind of animation, it's important to think about what's happening on the rest of Cape Ann, thinking about people being able to evacuate off, which roads are opened, um, which roads might have trees or might be flooded across the Cape. Next. And so to show this on the ground, we looked at motif number one specifically just because it's such a strong kind of cultural landscape that everyone recognizes and I'm sure has a connection to. Um, and so the storm arrives early in the morning there, of course, shop fronts, um, including dogs will be boarded and then boats will be moved to the inner harbor next. But during the storm, waves will surge over the neck and boats may also break free of their moorings with maximum storm surge around 15 feet in the inner harbor next. Meaning that there will be wreckage scattered through the inner harbor um, after the storm. Of course, motif number one was already damaged uh, in a nor'easter in 1978. And so um, this type of this will be essentially a repetitive lost uh, property potentially in the event of a large storm. Next. And so again, I really want to highlight that even though the cut bridge in these areas in Gloucester aren't a part of Rockport, a storm like this may damage those evacuation routes, which creates problems evacuating from Rockport um, just on transportation routes and other infrastructures that may not be within the town, but in other areas. Um, next. And this is also true of the Route 127 causeway, of course, um, which again, from Jane's presentation, is a road that's being stressed um, by salt and groundwater intrusion. Next. And this is really true of roads across Cape Ann that are vulnerable from both storm surge um, and sea level rise. Next. Um, and I also just want to highlight what Jim was um, saying, just noting how much wastewater treatment infrastructure is really located around the coast. Um, and again, these graphics are all online to spend more time with. Um, but in Rockport, you have the Pier Avenue pump station, the Dock Square pump station, um, and also the Back Beach pump station, just in the downtown area. Um, and luckily, as Jim talked about, there are solutions like elevating mechanical pieces in the pumps, um, but it's a vulnerability to highlight not only in Rockport, but also all across Cape Ann. Next. And I think not to add one other thing to consider, but just thinking about the vulnerability of the electric system as well. Um, the kind of key feeder cable that comes into Cape Ann uh, comes off of Beverly through Manchester, um, and then it goes right through Chubbs Creek 
um, and then downtown Manchester by the sea in an area that's also very um, flood prone. And so during a storm like the hurricane of 1938, uh, we can imagine that if that area is overwhelmed, it's estimated to take about two weeks to restore power to the Cape. Next. And so again, um, if you're interested, please look through our work in other places on Cape Ann. Um, you can also spend some time with some of the adaptation measures um, that we looked at next. And I'll post the link um, in the chat uh, next. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kira. A lot of information. And again, uh, Kira will post information on how to take a look at that um, have Harvard Graduate School design um, uh, scenario planning uh, website. So it's really cool. And I encourage folks to take a look at it and spend some time with it. You can, you know, zoom in and um, uh, see for yourself, uh, uh, watch it slowly, take some time with the information and take a look at those maps. And um, they're quite informative and um, you'll learn a lot. Uh, we're going to do Q&A now, also open form. And um, I just have a couple of ground rules. Uh, please raise your hand to speak. You can do that in the reactions uh, uh, um, section in the bottom of your Zoom. And um, if I don't see you, uh, somebody else can tell me, <laughs> um, as, as sometimes happens. Uh, but you can also use the chat for your questions. And right now, Tom, if you could let everybody in, um, thanks so much. Um, we'll get started on the Q&A. Um, actually, we do have one, uh, one question from the chat that I would like to put out to uh, Jim, if you could answer this one, um, from Joan Flynn. Would there be a benefit to combining forces with other Cape Ann towns to deal with these issues? I think that that was meant for you. Um, what do you what do you say about that? I know that there's been some talk about regionalizing the wastewater uh, treatment. I I don't know if that's moved forward or if you do you have any insight on that, Jim? Well, there was uh, the article in the Gloucester Daily Times today indicated that uh, Gloucester has agreed or is now has, has been told that they must. Um, uh, you know, rebuild their wastewater treatment plant within the next five years. Uh, I believe they're the only primary treatment plant in the U.S. Um, so, you know, here's the the way I look at this is that uh, Rockport has an aging um, sewer system and sewer plant. We have a tremendous amount of trouble with um, what's known as I&I, &I, inflow and infiltration into our plant. Um, our plant is terribly wasteful. Uh, it wastes water. Um, it is the single biggest user of energy in town, and it doesn't really produce anything other than treated sewage, which we put into our coastal ecosystem. Um, it's an antiquated technology, frankly, and there are much better technologies out there. And it would be great if we could transition to new technologies that didn't use that recycled water in some way, um, that uh, generated energy rather than using energy, and that didn't uh, pollute our coastal ecosystems. Um, the I think the possibility with Gloucester, though, is that if Gloucester is being forced to redo their plant, then it would really make sense for Gloucester to look at new technologies. Um, right now, Gloucester is already handling Essex uh, outflow. Manchester has a terrible problem with their um, sewer treatment plant because it is, I think it's literally below sea level. So they need to do something with that. And then, you know, Rockport you know, we desperately need to do something with ours to upgrade it. Um, uh, we have a we have a problem with water. We're we're constantly rationing water. Um, so if we had some way of recycling water, reclaiming water from our sewer system, that would be great. Um, and we are connected to Gloucester already uh, through Long Beach. 
So it, it seems to me like it's a perfect opportunity for Gloucester to combine with Essex, Manchester, and Rockport to develop a sewer treatment plant that could, could handle all of our needs. But but it really only makes sense if they're going to do something which is a new technology, I think. Um, but as I read the article today, it seemed as though they were they they might spend $150 million just to get their plant up to the technology that we've already been using for the last 50 years. Uh, and they're not, it doesn't seem as though they intend to move the plant. They're going to keep it where it is, which is also not very high above sea level. So one wonders what the thinking is there. I don't, I don't really get it, but I, there, there are some discussions. Um, I think that Bruce Tarr has been leading some of those discussions, and Seth Moulton has been involved as well. Um, it would be great if we could find a way to transition to new technology, I think, um, for the sewer system that um, you know handled Manchester, Gloucester, Essex, and Rockport all at the same time. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, does anyone uh, have a, a, a question? Um, Elizabeth Hardy, you can unmute yourself and um, ask the question. Elizabeth, you're muted. Uh, you just had it. If you could try again, otherwise you can just type it into the chat and I'll ask it for you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. So I have a question for Jim. Um, and I think uh, the question is for you. But lately we've been talking in Rockport about building more affordable housing. And I just wonder how we're going to do this with all the problems we have with the infrastructure and how are we going to handle it? And is, from what I understand, from what you said, that there is a treated sewage going into a Rockport Harbor. So I mean, obviously, that sounds like it's affecting the beaches, too. So, well, no, it doesn't. I mean, the the we're meeting all of our requirements in terms of environmental, um, you know, levels. Um, but it isn't, you know, it, it, taking raw water, uh, cleaning it, and then. Uh, you know, befouling it one way or the other, uh, and then, you know, chlorinating it, uh, treating it with uh, microbes and chemicals, and then discharging it into the harbor, all this, all the while pumping it, you know, throughout the town using electric pumps, which are extraordinarily inefficient, uh, is not the best solution available right now, given the technologies that we know about. Um, so, um, you know, there are there are other ways to handle it, but it's going to take some it's going to take some political courage at the state level and maybe beyond that to to move us in that direction. Um, with regard to your question about um, new development in town, I mean, that, the way I answer that is to say that, you know, we're we're struggling to handle the the population that we have currently. Um, and you know, what we need to do is to face the fact that our infrastructure is aging and is in desperate need of refurbishment. Uh, and if we do do the refurbishment, um, then we will have the capacity to handle additional development. It's a, you know, it's a it's an investment that we need to make irrespective of what we're doing with regard to zoning, I think. Um, so that's, you know, it's 
you know, we need to fix our sewer system and it's going to take a fair amount of money to seal it up. And if we do, then we'll have the capacity for additional development. Same thing with our water system. Uh, but right now we're struggling. Um, you know, we were last, so we're right now we're at about 90% of our regulated capacity in terms of um, sewer, and we were at about 95% of our regulated capacity in terms of the amount of water that we can pull out of our watershed. So um, we we have some real challenges uh, in front of us in terms of fixing our infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Elizabeth. Thanks for the answer, Jim. Um, Eric uh, Hutchins, uh, you have something in the chat. Do you want to come on and and um, ask that question or talk about that issue? Yeah, I just uh, had a question that I have not taken the time, but I know Gloucester for quite some time has been working on this new uh, flood zone regulations, uh, which I believe just recently passed. Um, um, amazingly, which was fantastic, I, I think. But has anyone in Rockport been evaluating uh, those regulations over in Gloucester? Uh, they passed over there and how might they be helpful or applicable to Rockport? Is there anyone, I mean, whether it's from a, any, any department started to look at those? Um, I don't know if our panel has an answer to that or if someone else on the call would like to answer that. I've, I've not picked up anything, but let me just make the suggestion. It would be good to begin to look at those since they've taken a lot of time and effort in Gloucester and a lot of public scrutiny um, might be something that's valuable for Rockport. Thanks, Thank Eric. You. Thanks so much. Um, Valerie, you have your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, just in response to Eric, there were a number of us in the Cape Ann Climate Coalition who were really supporting what Gloucester was doing. So without getting into a lot of the details, um, let me just say up front that FEMA will be sending new maps to communities all along the coast, which they've already started to do, which will be much more demanding of what communities have to provide for in their zoning. But the core of what happened in Gloucester is that for what are called velocity zones, which is along the coast where the direct impact of the storm surges and storms are felt, and Rockport is certainly able to identify, and, and Eric, you may, I'm sure you already know, where in Rockport there are these VE zones. In those areas, the Changes now are that there will be no new construction of housing. And if you have an existing house, you're, you're not gonna be allowed to uh, really expand the footprint. Maybe you can go up a little and do some re rehab work. In the, with what are called the AE zones, which are flooded zones, but without the direct impact of the wave energy. Um, I think there are things like, I'm sorry, I don't have, all the specifics to tell you because it's a very detailed zoning change but in those flood zones that are not where the high velocity waves are coming in there are restrictions on uh, the amount of new construction and expansion of existing structures that should be done so i think what we've learned in gloucester is that these increasingly strict uh, restrictions on housing construction along the shoreline are coming one way or another and FEMA when they really you know redraw the maps it filters down through the state government and Rockport will need to be in a year or two or whenever those maps start coming paying attention so I don't think that that approach is uh, under consideration currently in Rockport but Chatham has done this kind of thing, and now Rockport has. And it, I, I think it's a good idea, Eric, to have Rockport look at 
pulling way back from uh, too much construction in, in the high risk zones that we know that what's coming will damage them. And that will be a cost to the homeowners and also to municipalities that um, have to provide emergency services and utilities and also lose you know, tax the tax base when these houses go down. So I appreciate you bringing that up and I do encourage you all to look at what Gloucester did. It, it was a great, great step forward as part of the climate action plan in Gloucester. Thanks Valerie. Uh, Tom, you have your hand up. Tom Mikas. Yeah, I'm stepping out from behind the Zoom host uh, screen here, but uh, I'm on the Rockport Planning Board and we have been watching what's going on with the coastal uh, ordinances in, in Gloucester. And we have some uh, pending uh, modifications to our coastal floodplain that will come to town meeting on April 1st. We're actually having a hearing on the, uh, the uh, zoning uh, articles tomorrow night in town hall at, I can't remember, 6 or 6.30. And uh, so there will be some small steps toward um, making the coastal floodplain a little more restrictive. So uh, stay tuned for that at uh, town meeting, certainly. Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I wanted to actually bring Doug Rich back uh, to ask a question, Doug, of you, um, now that you've seen the presentations this evening and heard a little bit more, what are some of your, of your reflections on these presentations and in, in light of um, your story? Um, let's see. Am I unmuted? Yeah, I guess I am. Well, this is exactly the kind of information I was hoping to get. So this is this is very helpful um, in terms of you know what our concerns are. Um, I found especially interesting, the uh, the 2038, oh wait, was it 2038? Yeah, the storm projection, um, because that's exactly what we kind of, you know, feel we're, we're seeing that we may be in the midst of. And so, you know, looking at that, and then if, you know, how we plan against that very much uh, is is what we what we want to become more aware of. So yeah, I all I can say right now is that I think um, the information presented tonight, um, is very helpful. So I think we're going to need to get more involved and learn more about what's going on, actually. So I'd say the result so far is that this is prompts us to try to be more involved and understand more about what's happening. Um, the uh, yeah, and also the the questions about um, about infrastructure and where we stand with the current infrastructure were, were very helpful too in terms of being how we got to be at because I have heard the numbers of being at about you know ninety percent of capacity in some sense, but it's it's useful to understand the difference between. Um, the you know what's actually capacity for the the sewer and water systems and there where the where storm surge and things like that also fit into that so great thanks so much doug uh jane you have your hand up uh yes yeah, so i just wanted to mention in response to what doug said um that uh rockport harbor is uh i think kira mentioned that that uh, rockport harbor was well positioned for a hurricane um, coming up from from the south toward the western part of the state. Uh, but I would also like to point out that Rockport's very vulnerable to the nor'easters, and so as um, because the northeast winds come directly into the harbor. So as sea level rises, you're going to get uh, the impact of some of these big storms more frequently. The smaller storms will have the same impact as the larger storms today. So, um, you know, when you're thinking, Doug, you and your wife and your business and your neighbors and so on, when you're thinking about the future, think about um, these storms becoming more impactful over over time. And I'm I'm not saying that that's far out either. I mean, we saw some pretty big storms in 2018, and I think we can expect some more. Um, in, in the near future. Thanks, Jane. Um, Jim, there's another question for you in the chat from Valerie Nelson. Uh, what kind of water and wastewater system would you like to see built in Rockport? Uh, what would it look like? Yeah, I don't really have an answer to that, Frank. That's kind of a big question. Um, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, 
would it look like something where we are able to recapture water and either use, you know, convert wastewater into potable water? That would be great. Or at least convert wastewater into a gray water system. That would also be much better than what we have now. Um, you know, when I, when I say there are technologies out there that are better than what we're doing, I'm, I'm referring to actually what, it's kind of an old uh, technology, but Bill Gates um, had a um, sewer, and I've, I've spoken to Valerie about this in the past, um, but Bill Gates uh, many years ago paid to have a, uh, these kind of portable sewer plants developed for use in Africa. And they basically take um, um, sewage and uh, you know, they're basically the size of maybe a couple of semi uh, tractor trailers uh, together. So that terribly huge, but they, they take sewage and they um, generate electricity, clean water, fertilizer and ash. So, you know, it is possible <laughs> to do something much more, you know, creative and, and productive with, uh, with our sewage than what we're doing now. Um, I don't know what that would look like in Rockport, but um, it would be interesting to consider how we might move in that direction. Thanks, Jim. Uh, just a reminder to er everyone, you can uh, click on the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom if you'd like to ask a question. It's really helpful for me because I can see uh, once you raise your hand, you go right to the top and I can call on you. Um, any other thoughts from our panelists from this evening uh, that you might want to touch on? Maybe something that you didn't get a chance to stay in your presentations or uh, more questions from our, our audience? Um, we do have a, a, a question from Carol. Hey, good evening. Um, this was awesome. Thank you so much for um, pulling this together. Um, I have a sense that there is a lot of um, money out there for issues, um, the types of issues that Rockport is facing. I also know that, and when I say money out there, I mean state and federal programs. I also know that our volunteer boards are stretched very thin. Our town staff is stretched very thin. And I, I just think it would be great if there could be some sort of concerted effort um, to identify, like just sort of to plan, identify all the sources of potential funding, and then make a plan and figure out how we can start applying for these. Um, I'm sure people are aware when you get the Gloucester Daily Times, you see other communities getting state and federal dollars to deal with infrastructure issues, to deal with climate mitigation. And I just wish, um, you know, we could sort of, those of us that aren't stretched thin and aren't on three different boards, perhaps there could be a group of people who could get together and identify these funding sources and start working towards um, putting applications in for on behalf of Rockport. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. That comment, I'm gonna call on Mary. Mary, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, I was um, interested in what would happen with Millbrook Pond. I don't know if anybody could um, address that. Kira, could you take that since you mentioned it in your presentation? Yeah, so Millbrook Pond in the vulnerability study that Rockport put out, um, just there's a small dam, I believe, and so in the event of a large inland flooding situation, that could overtop spilling out over the cemetery, and that goes right over Front Street and downtown Rockport, and so that's an interesting example of having coastal flooding coming up from the ocean, and then also there are so many streams and brooks across Cape Ann, including in Rockport, um, that have been developed in certain areas. So you'll have streams that start upland um, and then as they go downstream, they'll either have dams or they'll maybe run over impervious surfaces like roads or parking lots. Um, and all along the way, it's important to just think about that water um, coming down 
uh, onto impervious surfaces is picking up pollutants from different cars uh, and uh, the chemicals, sometimes lawn fertilizers, and then all of that water is then flowing into the ocean. Um, and I want to let Eric jump in here because he will know more than I do. I'm muted. Eric, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, Mill Pond Dam is one one thing that I, I know a lot about. And, and you're absolutely right, Kira, about all of the stormwater impacts accumulating down there. But one thing you might not know is the town actually got significant FEMA and state money about 10 years ago. That dam will be the one thing standing after 300 feet of sea level rise. It was built with solid concrete core. We replaced the 1700s era dam of loose non uh, grouted granite blocks with a solid core, iron ferrous interior dam. The dam will go nowhere. And it was actually designed with uh, overflow capacity to meet um, modern dam safety standards. So it actually meets all permit requirements, all overflow specifications, probably more than 99% of the dams in Massachusetts right now. <laughs> Eric, what are the other dams then in Rockford and Gloucester that you think might be a threat during a storm like that? Well, if the Carlson Quarry Dam is actually starting to get old, but it's not falling apart. Um, probably, we don't actually have any significant dam failure threats other than this one over in West Gloucester that actually has earmarked money from the state to proceed with removal. Um, it's, a, it's a backyard dam um, that has absolutely no purpose. But other than that, Cape Ann's kind of lucky to not have any um, scary dams that are about to fail. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Kira. Um, Ed, you've got your hand up, so I want to call on you. I was uh, thinking what Jim said about the idea of working together on a sewer system, but I think I'd like to carry it a little bit further to the bigger picture, which is I think Cape Ann needs to think in terms of integrated planning board, uh, DPWs, I mean, the whole, the whole, all the town governmental services should be thought of in terms of having a core and a group of people who can be, work in these different areas with, in different communities as required. And I think that would make a big difference in terms of what we could expect uh, from the future in terms of systems, regulations, zoning, um, you name it. I think if I can just add kind of precedents from other places to support what Ed is saying, um, a lot of different municipalities have shifted toward having kind of a climate czar or sustainability manager, which is a full-time government position, generally at the municipal scale, someone dedicated to, um, I think it was Carol's point, just applying for grants and seeking out funding. And that's something um, maybe to consider. And then also there are some comprehensive zoning plans for regions now. Um, they're more like guidelines that different communities come together to define areas maybe that are on the coast that are likely uh, that are in FEMA flood zones or are likely to flood and then kind of inland receiving areas that perhaps um, could be areas uh, to construct new development and other ways of just thinking about as a region um, being able to have places for people to move if their properties start to flood on the coast. Ed, did you want to follow up on that or are you all set? No, I think that, that that's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm also talking about not just climate. I'm, I'm, I think that's important, but I think there are other areas where by working together in terms of our electrical system, a whole bunch of things that could be, uh, each each town would be still responsible for working out what they, you know, they needed and pulling those resources uh, from a group that can look at Cape Ann as an integrated uh, <laughs> problem or opportunity, depends on how you want to look at it. 
but I think that's a, you know, her, her comment is well taken. Great, Ed, thanks. Um, Jane, do you have a comment? Yeah, I would just say that uh, I think Ed's right. It's uh, the solutions to many of the problems is regionalization. Uh, but I also, the, the main reason I raised my hand was I wanted to just um, uh, mention what Jim had said about the reuse of wastewater. Um, that That is something that's really um, gonna take off at some point. Um, the people out in the West Coast are really looking seriously at it because water is a, is a, is a big issue out there. Um, and they're, able, they're doing it now and they're treating wastewater and it's pure. Um, it, it's just, there's a, there's a hurdle to get people to want to drink their wastewater. Um, but uh, once they're convinced that the, uh, the treatment of wastewater can make good drinking water, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I, I just would like to support Jim in, in, in that idea. Thanks, Jane. Um, anybody else have a question um, or would like to speak? Okay. Well, we're we're coming to the end of our webinar, I guess. Um, Jane, I was hoping you might be able to throw up that last slide. Sure, just a sec. You can always get in touch with us um, and uh, you can get in touch with me at, um, I'll put my uh, email in the chat. Um, please feel free to write to me. Oops, I sent it to someone else. Um, not everybody, it's Maureen at towngreen2025.org. Um, so, uh, Valerie, you, you have your hand up. Do you want to put in a last comment before I close out? This is kind of just a, kind of a response to Ed Hand, because I, I don't on principle object necessarily to regional solutions, but I think Gloucester has the impression, certainly with ideas about consolidation of schools, for example, is that Rockport is very much disinclined to collaborate with Gloucester. Um, I think, you know, this is a cultural question. So overall, I don't know if Ed wants to respond to that, but we over in Gloucester have the impression that Rockport is just kind of looking askance at this blue collar fishing port, whatever. And is that gonna stand in the way of collaboration. Well, um, thanks. Thanks for that, Valerie. I don't know if uh, anybody wants to take that. I know I'm a rock porter and I love Gloucester. So, <laughs> um, uh, okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, we're going to close the, the webinar right now. Um, thanks so much for joining us this evening. <clears throat> um, I just want to remind everyone that we have a, a field trip coming up on Tuesday, March 21st, 1130. We will meet at Barletta Park. We'll take a look at the dock square area that was outlined this evening. And we'll also take a walk down Bearskin Neck to take a look at um, vulnerable areas. It might even stop into Susie's Stories, uh, which is open 11 to six every single day. So if you're looking for a good read, um, maybe we'll we'll take take a visit there. Doug, I hope that you and Susie might be in that day um, or might join us uh, for the field trip. The field trips are widely popular and we love uh, having people there to have conversations and also ask lots of questions. Yeah. Um, the That's third great. and last, the third and last, oh, Doug, did you want to say something? Well, I just wanted to, Thanks for the plug on the store, but I just wanted to point out because we're not open from 11 to 6 every day um, in the winter. So we got winter hours. So I don't want somebody to come down to Bear Skin Neck, you know, during the early part of the week and find that we're closed. So uh, we're only open Thursday through Sunday uh, during the winter until hopefully we get to, you know, spring hours pretty soon. But just so people know. Thanks for that clarification, Doug. Um, well, we'll have to wait. I mean, it is spring, so it's it's coming. Um, Bears Connect will be, all will be open soon, but join us for that field trip. 
Um, there, there are lots of fun, and, and we love having lots of folks there. We get at least thirty people for every every field trip. Um, and our last Rockport workshop will address adaptation solutions for both Long Beach and downtown Rockport. We'll have a series of presentations on adaptation adaptation solutions, and we will also have breakout sessions. So participants who are in the webinar will be broken into either a Long Beach um, conversation or a downtown Rockport conversation. So we hope that you will join us. You can register for that right now. Um, you can join our newsletter and we'll be sending out more information about that shortly. We'll also be up on the Town Green website, towngreen2025.org. Um, Town Green is a nonprofit and we rely on your contributions. Um, to provide these community education programs. If you feel um, that you would like to donate, we would love that. And we thank you very much for joining us um, this evening. If you have any questions, again, you can get in touch with me at maureen at towngreen2025.org. I'll be happy to answer your questions or put you in touch with someone who can answer them. Thanks for joining us this evening. See you soon. Thank you for mentioning this. I've forgotten all about it, so I